Welcome to chapter four. This chapter is on love, intimacy, and sexual communication. So love is a big part of sexuality for a lot of people, and research shows the most physically and emotionally satisfying sex occurs in committed long-term relationships. In fact, 65% of people report they would not have sex with someone unless they loved them. And people in committed relationships tend to engage in a wider variety of sexual activities. So we will be talking about monogamous relationships in this chapter because that is the most common. However, there are lots of different types of relationships. For example, there's polyamory, which is intimate relationships with more than one person, with consent from all people involved, and uh, there are lots of other types as well. So we'll get into all of that. Um, let's begin. As always, we'll uh, take a little walk down history lane. So today we're going to start in the 1750s with love and marriage in America, uh, which is quite different than how it is today. Um, a good match was based on money, so how much the woman's parents could offer for a dowry or a lump sum of money for marrying their daughter. And the match was also based on the man's potential for making good money. So those two things together was really what marriage was based on. Courtships were short and marriage followed quickly. Um, and this was in part due to shorter lifespans. In fact, an unmarried woman between uh, 22 to 27 was called an old maid. And an unmarried man actually had to pay a bachelor tax. Um, so one practice that was common in this time was bundling. And this is when people would um, couples would sleep in the same bed at their parents' house, fully clothed and sewn into the bedding with a board between them, which was intended to increase the emotional connection. Um, but not allow for sex. So you can see that here on the slide. And bundling was typically done during courtship. So let's watch this video clip on the history of marriage. Hey there, welcome to Life Noggin. Have you ever loved someone so much you wanted to marry them? I haven't yet, but that might be because I'm in animation. When and why did humans decide they wanted to stay together forever? We're gonna discuss that and more right now. Let's get started. Marriage is actually a concept so old that it predates recorded history. In ancient times, the two being wed often had no say in who they were going to marry. Families would use marriage as a way to form an alliance between other families. Marriage was taken very seriously, often having to do with money and or land, rather Rather than love and emotion. This would be the case for a long time up until the 18th century. The Industrial Revolution played a huge role in marrying for love. With the rise of the middle class in the 19th century, men would be able to work to afford a marriage. They got to choose a spouse without having to worry about land or parental approval. Arranged marriages aren't completely out of the picture today though. Many Indian families arrange men for their daughters to marry, and vice versa. Now let's talk about different types of marriages. Polygamy, or marrying multiple people, is something that was very popular in the past. Some men back in biblical times would have upwards of a thousand wives. I can't even remember that many names. Monogamy, or marrying one person, didn't really become the norm until the 9th century. Same-sex marriage can be dated back to the beginning of the Roman Empire, and that is way back in the day. In 2001, the Netherlands was the first country to officially legalize same-sex marriage. Belgium followed suit in 2003, and Spain and Canada shortly after in 2005. America is still running on a state-by-state -state basis when it comes to recognizing same-sex marriage, and at the time of this video being uploaded, the current number of states allowing it is 32. Now, when you think marriages, you might first think about wedding rings. But where does the whole engagement ring tradition come from? Well, there are a lot of traditions from many cultures that brought this norm about. Ancient Egyptians were buried wearing rings on the third finger of their left hand. This finger was thought to be connected by a vein to their heart. One of the first recorded uses of a traditional engagement ring was in 1477. Archduke Maximilian of Austria proposed to Mary of Burgundy with a diamond ring. Engagement rings in America wouldn't become popular until the 1930s. At the time, one diamond company boosted sales in America by having celebrities sport the shiny jewelry, and by 1965, 80% of brides were showing off their new rock. Or mineral, really. Are you married? Would you ever want to get married? Who would you want to marry? That's enough marriage talk, I don't want to scare you away or anything. Don't forget to come back every Monday for a brand new video. Also, make sure you put a ring on it by clicking that like button. And if you want even more Life Noggin, check out these other episodes down below, and make sure you follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Blocko, this has been Life Noggin. Don't forget to keep on thinking. So how do we choose who we're going to have intimate relationships with? Well, we all have a set of criteria in our head that determines this. Even if you are not aware of the criteria, it is there and it's functioning all the time, even if you are currently in a relationship. 
Um, and so there's something called the field of eligibles, which are all the individuals who meet that criteria as a potential romantic partner. And it's a good thing. It guides us towards relationships that will meet our needs. Um, but it can change as you experience different relationships. Okay, so let's see if we can become aware of that criteria that exists in our heads. Uh, so for lecture activity number one, I would like for you to, uh, for this chapter, chapter four, I'd like for you to write down all of the different characteristics that you would look for in an intimate relationship. So with a boyfriend or girlfriend, husband or wife. Um, so just make a list, try to have at least 10 things on there at a minimum. So studies show that physical attractiveness is a top priority in choosing an intimate partner. Um, so physical attractiveness or the level of physical attractiveness you're looking for is usually a part of your field of eligibles. Um, and there's something in our society that is actually a very powerful phenomenon in how we select romantic partners, friends, how we treat strangers, um, and a whole host of other things are affected by this. And it's called the beautiful is better bias. There's a whole host of research on this. For example, studies show that attractive children are more popular with classmates and teachers. Attractive applicants have a better chance of getting jobs and receiving a higher salary. Attractive defendants are found guilty less often and given lesser sentences. And attractive people are talked to more and liked more in social situations. We also assume attractive people are good and assume other positive traits about them. You can just look to any Disney movie to see this. The villain is usually unattractive and the hero is usually an attractive person. Um, and then men agree on what is attractive more than women do. So women are pretty diverse in their attitudes towards uh, what's attractive in men. And another fun fact is that males tend to earn $600 more a year per inch. So there is um, a benefit to being tall for males uh, that also exists in females, but it's just a lot more pronounced in males. Okay, so for lecture activity two, I would like for you to give me an example that you've seen either in your own uh, personal experiences or in the media um, that supports the theory of the beautiful is better bias. So I gave an example in the lecture of how Disney movies have the attractive characters be the good uh, people or the heroes, and then they have the villains or the bad people be unattractive. So give me an example of where you've seen the beautiful is better bias. Consider um, work situations, relationships, media, um, just being out and about and maybe attitudes that you have towards people or first impressions um, or ways you've been treated. Um, that might be good examples of the beautiful is better bias. So give me two to three sentences on that for lecture activity two. So we are physically attracted to good looking, but what good looking is, is determined and reinforced largely by culture. And one element of culture that affects um, our perception of what is physically attractive is the media. The effects of media on what we consider beautiful is very powerful. And what is whatever is considered attractive today is constantly shown in the media, and this exposure makes people think those standards are normal and attainable. Now, being thin is a standard for beauty, but only 5% of women can actually attain the body that is seen in the media. 8 to 10 women express dissatisfaction with their bodies, and the standards for uh, attractiveness change all the time. Um, if you look on the slide, here is an ad from the 50s for a product that would actually help people to gain weight. Um, and Marilyn Monroe, in her time, uh, was a sex symbol, and she would be what is now considered a plus-size model. Um, so our ideal body type is constantly changing. And studies show that men are mostly pleased with their bodies. Um, they tend to overestimate their attractiveness and fail to see physical flaws more than women do. There's also something called the matching hypothesis, um, and this is the theory that people tend to seek romantic and sexual partners who possess a level of physical attractiveness that's similar to their own. So studies analyzing romantic couples find they tend to be close to equal on physical attractiveness, and matched couples tend to have more intimate relationships than unmatched couples. And recent studies have found that gay men actually match more on attractiveness 
then lesbians uh, use attractiveness to find a match. So we're going to watch some videos here on what heterosexual people consider physically attractive in the opposite sex. So first we'll start with um, what men find physically attractive about women, and then the next video clip will be what women find physically attractive about men. I'm pretty sure it was a poet or a great scholar that once said, we're genetically engineered to flirt. If we don't flirt, we don't have sex. And if we don't have sex, we don't reproduce. But in order for the flirting process to begin, a man has to be physically attracted to a woman. How does this happen? I talked to Dr. Midge Wilson at DePaul University, and she said that anytime a man checks out a woman, he's actually performing what Wilson calls a reproductive fitness assessment. It's the combination of a number of factors that have been scientifically proven to make women physically attractive to men. According to New Zealand anthropologist Barnaby Dixon, men prefer a larger waist to hips ratio of 7 to 10 over a closer ratio of 9 to 10. The waist and hips are important factors when it comes to childbirth. So when men see a ratio that they perceive to be favorable, they're subconsciously thinking, she could have my baby. Researchers at University College London determined a higher pitched female voice is more likely to be perceived by men as attractive. The high voice not only signifies youth, but also a smaller body. A couple of German scientists said that long, lustrous, healthy hair plays a big part in female attractiveness, again connoting health and fertility. Of course, none of these factors can be controlled, at least not naturally. But here are a few scientifically proven attractors that women can achieve on their own. Scientists at the University of British Columbia cite smiling as a major factor in what makes women attractive. The whiter the teeth, the better. But interestingly enough, women actually prefer the opposite for men. Women prefer a guy who keeps a straight face. A study at Bangor University showed that men preferred women who wore up to 40% fewer cosmetics. The natural look is in. According to a study in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, the color red enhances males' attraction to females. This also goes for animals. The study found the same effect in some non-human primates. To review, here are some of the scientifically proven factors that make women physically attractive. A waist-to-hip ratio of 7 to 10. A higher voice. Healthy hair. Smiling. Less makeup and the color red. Follow these steps, and the human race should be around for a long time to come. What he said. How does that feel, baby? Mmm, lower. How does that feel, baby? Uh. Another factor in attraction is proximity. So the proximity effect is the theory that the closer you are to another person in geographical distance, the greater the probability that you will grow to like or even love that person. And studies do show that you are more likely to like your neighbors, coworkers, people in class, 
and people who sit next to you more than others. And the closer you are to someone physically, the more opportunity you have to get to know them. So this kind of makes sense. The more you are in the same situation with someone, the more you have in common, and common interests are really a basis for relationships. In fact, studies show the two most common places where relationships begin are school and work. There's also something called the mere exposure effect, and this is the psychological principle that humans appear to have a natural and usually unconscious tendency to grow fonder of a novelty stimulus the more they are exposed to it. And it's true of almost anything. Um, the more we're exposed to a certain kind of food, the more we start to like it. So maybe the first time you had sushi, it was gross, but then by the tenth time, it's like your favorite food. Um, this happens all the time with music, right? The first time you hear a song, you're like, oh, Rihanna, this one sucks. And by the end of the week, it's your ringtone. Um, products in TV commercials you tend to like more after you see the commercial over and over and over again. And so this is also true of people. Um, and this means that even if you don't talk to a person, just seeing them repeatedly can make you grow fond of them. The exception happens when you strongly dislike someone upon first meeting. Then repeated exposure can actually make you like them less. Another factor in attraction is similarity. And studies show that 77% of college students believe that opposites attract. But studies show that this is really not true. In fact, research indicates that we are attracted to people with similar attitudes, interests, and personality traits as us. We want someone who sees the world we do, enjoys the same activities, agrees on major issues and decisions, supports our attitudes and beliefs, and really overall validates our self-concept. If we have someone who disagrees with us all the time, that typically doesn't feel good. Um, and so this doesn't mean that we want our twin, but we tend to want someone that we have a lot in common with. And studies show that couples in long-term relationships even assumed similarities that were not there with their partners. So they would say, oh yeah, yeah, my partner also loves to hike. Um, and then when their partner would be interviewed, they'd be like, no, I actually hate hiking. Um, so people even will go as far as to assume similarities. And in another study uh, where couples would say that they were, in fact, in love with their opposite, they would ask each person in the relationship to write down a list of um, the other's traits. And what they would find is that overwhelmingly the people were incredibly similar. They thought that they were opposites, but in fact they were very similar. Maybe they were different on one thing, like the way they dressed or the type of food they liked. But overwhelmingly they had um, a majority of characteristics in common. And another factor in attraction is actually the reciprocity of attraction, which is the idea that someone you like or love likes or loves you back. They reciprocate your feelings with approximately the same degree of intensity. So in one study, they had two students paired up, and one student told uh, was told that the other student either liked them or didn't by the experimenter. And the next time the pair talked, if they had been told that the other person liked them, they were friendlier and disclosed more information. So relationships are built on balance, balance of control, balance of money matters, balance of decision making, etc. And these things do not need to be equal, but one should not be overly controlled by one's partner. So when we feel like our part partner likes us as much as we like them, we are more open and intimate. And when we feel a lack of balance, we tend to develop anxiety, fear, sadness, guilt, resentment, etc. So this may explain why people with low self-esteem and high self-doubt tend to have relationship problems. They feel no one could love them equally, so they perceive a lack of reciprocity and a lack of balance. So, so far we've talked about a bunch of different factors that affect um, our attraction to someone, including this, the reciprocity of attraction, similarity, the proximity effect, the mere exposure effect, and physical attractiveness. But of course the brain um, and what is going on chemically and hormonally also affects who we're attracted to. So let's watch a video now on the science of attraction. We like to think of romantic feelings as spontaneous and indescribable things that come from the heart. But it's actually your brain running a complex series of calculations within a matter of seconds that's responsible for determining attraction. Doesn't sound quite as poetic, does it? But just because the calculations are happening in your brain doesn't mean those warm, fuzzy feelings are all in your head. 
In fact, all five of your senses play a role, each able to vote for or veto a budding attraction. The eyes are the first components in attraction. Many visual beauty standards vary between cultures and eras, and signs of youth, fertility, and good health, such as long, lustrous hair or smooth, scar-free skin, are almost always in demand because they're associated with reproductive fitness. And when the eyes spot something they like, our instinct is to move closer so the other senses can investigate. The nose's contribution to romance is more than noticing perfume or cologne. It's able to pick up on natural chemical signals known as pheromones. These not only convey important physical or genetic information about their source, but are able to activate a physiological or behavioral response in the recipient. In one study, a group of women at different points in their ovulation cycles wore the same t-shirts for three nights. After male volunteers were randomly assigned to smell either one of the worn shirts or a new unworn one, saliva samples showed an increase in testosterone in those who had smelled a shirt worn by an ovulating woman. Such a testosterone boost may give a man the nudge to pursue a woman he might not have otherwise noticed. A woman's nose is particularly attuned to MHC molecules, which are used to fight disease. In this case, opposites attract. When a study asked women to smell t-shirts that had been worn by different men, they preferred the odors of those whose MHC molecules differed from theirs. This makes sense. Genes that result in a greater variety of immunities may give offspring a major survival advantage. Our ears also determine attraction. Men prefer females with high-pitched, breathy voices and wide, formant spacing, correlated with smaller body size, while women prefer low-pitched voices with a narrow, formant spacing that suggest a larger body size. And not surprisingly, touch turns out to be crucial for romance. In this experiment, not realizing the study had begun, participants were asked to briefly hold the coffee, either hot or iced. Later, the participants read a story about a hypothetical person and were asked to rate their personality. Those who had held the hot cup of coffee perceived the person in the story as happier, more social, more generous, and better-natured than those who had held the cup of iced coffee, who rated the person as cold, stoic, and unaffectionate. If a potential mate has managed to pass all these tests, there is still one more, the infamous first kiss a rich and complex exchange of tactile and chemical cues, such as the smell of one's breath and the taste of their mouth. This magical moment is so critical that a majority of men and women have reported losing their attraction to someone after a bad first kiss. Once attraction is confirmed, your bloodstream is flooded with norepinephrine, activating your fight or flight system. Your heart beats faster, your pupils dilate, and your body releases glucose for additional energy. Not because you're in danger, but because your body is telling you that something important is happening. To help you focus, norepinephrine creates a sort of tunnel vision, blocking out surrounding distractions, possibly even warping your sense of time and enhancing your memory. This might explain why people never forget their first kiss. The idea of so much of our attraction being influenced by chemicals and evolutionary biology may seem cold and scientific rather than romantic, but the next time you see someone you like, try to appreciate how your entire body is playing matchmaker to decide if that beautiful stranger is right for you. So one of the things that happens when we are attracted to someone is often flirting. And so flirting is defined as subtle behaviors designed to signal sexual or romantic interest in another person. It's considered a biological and evolutionary phenomenon. It allows us to check someone out without commitment, um, to check them out before sex, and with little risk of emotional rejection. And studies show that most of us flirt very similar, similarly to each other and follow a similar pattern. And so in order for researchers to collect data on how people flirt, they often go to bars, to clubs, to speed dating, um, and places like that where they can observe people flirting and then find the patterns in those behaviors. And so they have found a pattern of flirting, and it involves what they call the approach, talk, swivel and turn, touch, and synchronization. Um, this is like a dance. At each step, one person must respond, and then the advance uh, the flirting advances to the next level. 
So the approach, uh, the first step in the pattern of flirting, is that eye contact is usually initiated by the woman. They scan the room, they meet eyes, and then continue to stare or look down and then back up. And the second um, part of the pattern is talk. So men usually initiate small talk. Studies show too much self-disclosure here is a turnoff, like TMI. And men usually ask questions during this phase. And then the third part is swivel and turn. So usually the people start off standing side by side, and then they begin to turn towards each other a little at a time until they're face to face. And then um, the next step in the pattern is touch. And this is usually uh, the woman who introduces the first touch, which will seem accidental. For example, they'll touch the person's arm when they say something funny or pick lint off of his face or his shirt. And then the next uh, part in the pattern is synchronization. And this is um, body movement that starts to happen in unison. So one person will put their uh, drink down, and so does the other one. One person will shift their weight, and so does the other person. Um, they'll turn their heads and sit and stand at the same time. And this is usually happening unconsciously, but it shows that they are kind of synced up. And usually after the five steps, a male will suggest continuing the intimacy, um, like going on a date or sex, if the person is interested. And if not, it's at this point that the relationship usually ends. Okay, so let's watch this video on how science says you could be a better flirter. Good news, Uggos. Science is telling you there's still a chance. Hey guys, Tara here for D News, and it turns out knowing how to flirt may get you laid. Who knew, right? It's crazy. A team of psychologists at Webster University has discovered that not only is flirting important in picking up the opposite sex, or same sex if that's your thing, it's actually more effective than looking good. Scientists studied various flirting techniques used in places like singles bars and shopping malls and found that it's not the most physically attractive people who get approached but the ones who signal their availability and confidence through basic flirting. Of course, the two most universal techniques are smiling and making eye contact. Those are pretty powerful on their own, but what else can be done to seal the deal? For women, things like flipping your hair or licking your lips can be a good signal, and studies have shown that playing hard to get works as long as you're enthusiastic about the person you're with. For men, research shows that the most effective flirting technique early on involves displays of social dominance. And no, that does not mean walking into a bar and peeing all over the floor. Believe it or not, women do not like that. What they do like is much more subtle behavior. Briefly glancing at the person you're interested in. Positioning your body so it takes up more space. Changing your location at a bar more frequently and making playful, non-reciprocated contact with male friends. The study shows that men who do these things receive preferential attention from women. And anecdotally, I can tell you that a group of guys is much less intimidating than one guy standing at the bar alone, presumably for the sole purpose of picking up girls. Also, leave the cheesy pickup lines at home. Research shows that women tend to prefer innocuous opening lines over direct or clever ones, whereas men actually want women to be direct about their intentions. Once you're actually engaged in conversation with someone, the study says that touching can be the most effective flirting technique. And sure enough, research shows that a light touch on the forearm can make a man more successful in getting a girl's number. But guys, I cannot stress this enough. It's all about context. In general, women are much less receptive to being touched by people they don't know. So stick with the pleasantries at first, a handshake, maybe a light shoulder tap, until you know for certain that she's interested. If you're getting clear signals, then maybe try mixing it up with a playful forearm touch or a light brush of the waist. And if you really can't tell whether or not she's interested, there are some dead giveaway signs. A woman who's comfortable with you will speak smoothly and quickly, and she won't wince or pull away if you try to touch her arm. In fact, that right there is probably the best barometer you have. But again, context is everything, so if a woman is clearly not feeling it, back off. There is nothing more unappealing than a guy who can't get a hint. With that, I will leave the men watching this with one last piece of personal advice, not yet proven by science, but effective nonetheless, which is that self-awareness goes a very, very long way. Girls can tell when you're trying too hard, so instead of sticking to a tried and true formula, try just having a conversation. You know, like you actually care about what the other person has to say. It's an insane concept, I know, but it works. 
Okay, so there are a lot of theories on what love is, and there have been countless studies done. Um, and so it's a very difficult topic to kind of define and study scientifically because it's a little bit ambiguous in nature. But what we do know is that love, and we're talking about romantic and um, the type of love when you're sexually attracted to someone. So love in the early stages is characterized by an intense physical arousal. We see that when someone is in love with someone and that crush comes around them, they might get butterflies or blush, for example. Um, love in the early stages is also characterized by an all-encompassing interest in another individual. Every song that comes on the radio was written just for you. They're all you can think about. Um, which leads to the next characteristic, which is fantasizing about the other person. Um, love in the early stages is also characterized by relatively rapid swings of emotion, which have a lot to do with how much attention you're receiving from the person that you're interested in. So if they're texting you back, you're, like, ecstatic. And if they're not responding to your texts, texts you're, like, severely depressed. And then um, the uh, last characteristic that research has found that we see in the early stages of uh, love is an exaggeration of the other person's good qualities. Um, so if they're funny, they're like the funniest person you've ever known. And a minimization of the negative ones, so a tendency to overlook some of their flaws or their weaknesses. Okay, let's watch a video now on this science, the science of love in the early stages and what goes on with us in our brains. I believe it was Kesha that said, your love your love, your love is my drug. And you know what? Neurobiologists just might agree with that. Hey everyone, Lacey Green here for D News. Kesha is only one of the most recent in a long line of artists who have compared love to a drug. I mean, the highs and lows of love are really one of the main inspirations out there for art and music, and there's a neurobiological basis for all the hubbub. The experience of love is super intense and real. In the brain, it actually looks a bit like you're on cocaine. One of the major evolutionary theories posited by neurobiologists separates romantic love into three stages. The first is lust, which is the spark of attraction that kind of makes you think about sexy things with them, like kissing them or touching them, you know, like you're really far from being repulsed by them. During this stage, men and women experience a spike in testosterone, the hormone responsible for sex drive. For some relationships, the lust is, you know, consummated and then they move on. But some relationships go on to stage two. Stage two is the attraction phase. This is when things get a little more crazy up here. If triggered, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin take your brain temporarily hostage. People in this phase seem like they're losing their mind, and in a way, they kind of are. Dopamine pathways in the brain trigger the brain's reward system, which is responsible for the obsessive behavior. You crave them, can't wait to see them. You think about all the wonderful possibilities that you have together. Norepinephrine makes your heart race and your hands clammy, you might lose sleep or experience a decrease in appetite, and serotonin, the hormone responsible for feelings of peace and calm, dips down when you're falling in love because nature's a jerk. So we feel heightened anxiety and in combination with dopamine we feel the highest highs when things go well and the lowest of lows when they don't. In relationships where the attraction phase is experienced by both people, things are all intense and euphoric for a little while but then they mellow out as the couple advances to stage three. Stage three is the attachment phase. It's when you settle and get comfortable with your partner, anxieties drop, and you begin forming a deeper and more intimate bond as you get to know each other really, really well, sometimes too well. And you learn that your relationship maybe isn't so hot now that you're not basically high all the time. The stage's main hormone is oxytocin. Oxytocin is a cuddle hormone and it's released when people touch, both sexually and non-sexually. It's responsible for the intense bond between mom and baby and for the days you feel after you have an orgasm. Oxytocin is the hormonal glue in a long-term relationship and in a healthy relationship, it leaves you with a profound sense of attachment and trust, which is a good foundation for what sometimes comes next, having kids. Personally, I think understanding the neurobiology behind love makes it that much more beautiful, that love is so essential to our species that it's hardwired in our brains. But I do know people who feel like it's really unromantic and just too technical, takes away all the magic. So let me know what your take is in the comments below. And if you haven't seen it yet, go show some love to Anthony's video because I think he's feeling a bit of Valentine's Day stress. I'll see you guys next time. 
Um, and there was a psychologist named Robert Sternberg, and he developed a theory uh, that has three fundamental components to it. And those um, components are intimacy, passion, and commitment. Um, and so what he says is that the combination of these different elements constitutes the kind of love that one experiences. So, for example, if you just are experiencing intimacy, um, then you're just having what he would define as liking. If you are experiencing passion and intimacy, he would call that romantic love. So, um, these three components exist on a scale. And so, how much you feel of each component or the intensity of each component um, will give you a feeling of how much you are loved or the amount of love you are experiencing. So if there's a lot of intimacy, you're going to feel like you're more loved. So just to be clear, he defines intimacy as the feelings of closeness, connectedness, and bondedness. Passion, he defines as the drives that lead to romance, physical attraction, and sexual consummation. And then commitment, he defines as, in the short term, the decision to love the other person, and in the long term, the decision to maintain that love. Um, and so he says that a relationship based on a single element is less likely to survive than one that's based on two or more of these elements. And he also says that the type of love you experience will change over time, even within one relationship. So um, basically Sternberg argues that what we're kind of taught here in the Western culture um, about what love is, like in the Disney movies, for example, where you meet your Prince Charming and then the movie ends and it's like happily ever after, is actually not what research shows relationships really look like. But in fact, um, when the movie ends and the, you know, it says happily ever after, that's actually when the real uh, relationship begins. Um, and so at that point, we might experience the romantic love for a little while, but then, you know, 10 years in, you know, we might experience some empty love, and then that might switch to companion love, and that might switch to fatuous love. So it's always kind of changing and evolving, and relationships really sort of ebb and flow. And he says that in um, the Western cultures, we really do emphasize romantic love, but in non-Western cultures, the emphasis tends to be on companion love. So this theory suggests that um, consummate love, having intimacy, passion, and commitment, and having a strong amount of each is really the ultimate goal of each of us. Okay, so as Sternberg mentioned um, in his theory, his triangular theory of love, um, he says that relationships change over time. And so we're going to watch a video clip that um, uses science to explain why, like, the honeymoon phase ends and the different ways in which relationships change. When you first fall in love, it's a whirlwind of crazy emotions and obsession and anxiety, and then eventually it's not. So did you fall out of love or did it turn into something new? Hey there, loved ones. Julian here for D News. If you've ever fallen in love, you know it does all sorts of odd things to you. Your palms get sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. You tell her you can cook, but you can only make spaghetti. At first, it's totally exhilarating. Then, over time, you get more comfortable, but no less in love. What's changed inside your brain? Why does young love feel so different than old love? Scientists have wondered the same thing, and they've used fMRI machines to peer into people's brains and find out what's happening when you first tumble head over heels for someone. It turns out love feels so good because it makes two regions of your brain light up, the caudate nucleus and the ventral tegmental area. Both these regions are associated with reward and pleasure because they're rich in dopamine. But dopamine isn't the only neurotransmitter giving you that distinct new love feel. Oxytocin and vasopressin are mixed into the mental cocktail too. Oxytocin is released after sex or skin-to-skin -skin contact and produces feelings of contentment and security, bringing couples closer together. Vasopressin is also associated with long-term bonding. New love doesn't just amplify neurotransmitters, it reduces some too. When you're in that phase, your body releases a hormone, cortisol, also known as the stress hormone. As cortisol levels rise in the body, serotonin levels in the brain go down. As a neurotransmitter, serotonin helps relay messages from one area of the brain to another. And Harvard Medical School's Richard Schwartz says its depletion causes those intrusive, maddening thoughts you have when you're in the early stages of love. It's what causes infatuation and obsession. And finally, new love can shut down some neural pathways
pathways altogether, particularly the one that connects the nucleus acumens to the amygdala. That pathway is associated with fear and social judgment. It helps us make critical assessments of people. Ever fallen in love with someone who was objectively terrible and then later wondered why you didn't see it? Well, now you know why. Over time, some of these chemical levels change. Your body stops pumping out cortisol and your serotonin levels come back up. That's why that anxiety goes away and you stop worrying about how you look or if you're coming off as too needy. And you actually become less needy because the higher levels of serotonin make you less obsessive. Your brain and body are less stressed and you stop feeling that manic craving for your romantic partner. But that doesn't mean you can't be madly in love with someone, even after decades. Since oxytocin levels are boosted after sex, those can be brought back up at any time with a roll in the hay. Other neurotransmitter levels can remain constant. A 2011 study by Stony Brook University compared the brain activity of couples who had just fallen in love to couples that had been married for 21 years on average. Those dopamine centers in the brain associated with reward and pleasure were just as rich in the older couples as the new ones. So over time, they had gotten more comfortable, but still felt just as happy. We can't do D-News episodes without our sponsors, so we'd like to thank K Jewelers for sponsoring this episode. For 100 years, every kiss begins with K. You may not be in a relationship right now, but still want to feel some of that touchy-feely goodness. So, can you make someone fall in love with you? Find out here. Which do you prefer, intense romance or long-term love? Let us know in the comments, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time on D-News. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the styles of love. And the styles of love are based off of a psychologist by the last name Lee. And Lee's theory is that people follow individual psychological motifs or styles in relating to a love partner. So certain styles fit better together than others, but most people prefer the same love style as themselves. So the first type of love style is Eros love. And this is an erotic, passionate style of love, often characterized by short-lived relationships. So Cupid's counterpart in Greek mythology is named Eros. And in this type of love, there's a great emphasis on romance and physical beauty. This type of love uh, believes in love at first sight. And they believe in sexual intimacy early in a relationship. They tend to value touch sensations above others. And uh, this type of lover is based on a passion that can't be maintained for long. And therefore, relationships... Um, with two people that are in Eros love burn out rather quickly. And then there's Ludus love, and this is a love style that focuses on the excitement of forming a relationship more than the relationship itself, and typically moves rapidly from one relationship to another. So Ludus is Greek for play, and this is a type of love characterized by game playing. So people of this style like the chase better than the relationship, they enjoy flirting and seduction. They move in and out of relationships and sometimes will even juggle multiple partners. So they're unlikely to form a lasting relationship because when the chase is over, then they're bored. Um, the next type of love is storage love. And this is a love style characterized by caring and friendship. So storage is Greek for natural affection, which is, uh, as I said, characterized by friendship. And so people of this type of love begin relationships as friends and take a while to fall in love. Um, sexual intimacy develops slowly and really takes a backseat to friendship. And so storage love offers peace, security, and stability. And these people usually stay friends with their exes. The next type of love is mania love, which is a possessive, dependent, and often controlling style of love. So mania is Greek for madness. Um, and so this type of uh, love is possessive, dependent, and controlling. And people uh, that have this style of love fear that their partner will leave and they need constant reassurance. So partners of mania lovers often feel excited that they're loved so much at first, but then they get creeped out by the jealousy, clinginess, and insecurity. And when their partner starts drifting away, mania lovers may stalk, threaten suicide, or even become violent in extreme cases. The next style of love is pragma love, and this is a love style in which partners are selected in a business-like way on the basis of rational, practical criteria. So pragma is Greek for business, um, and so this is often characterized as practical love. And people of this love style decide to love based on areas of compatibility, like education level, profession, status, income, potential as a parent, material possessions, and they actually place little emphasis on emotion, so the relationships are usually unsuccessful. 
And then the last type is agape love. And this is the style of love focused on giving the partner whatever he or she may want or need without the expectation of receiving anything in return. So agape is Greek for brotherly or divine love. It's a selfless, altruistic, self-sacrificing type of love. And it gives without expectation of receiving anything in return. People of this love style are patient and non-demanding. And this type of love tends to not be great for romantic love because uh, relationships require a certain amount of give and take and balance, like we've talked about before. All right, for lecture activity two, um, you're going to follow along with the video coming up, and then you are going to write down which of the six styles of love uh, your test results indicated you are, and then whether or not you agree or disagree with uh, those results. So just name the um, style of love that, that the test said you are, and then in uh, one to two sentences, say at a minimum, say if you agree or disagree and why. So you're going to need to um, like write down your responses. So as you're watching the video, you're going to take a test. So you might want to pad and paper or just do it on a Word document or something on your computer. What is your love style? Love in. <clears throat> love is not sex and sex is not love, but love making is a way to describe a type of sex and sex is a way of demonstrating love. So I explain Lee's colors a model of love styles designed by psychologist John Allen Lee in the 70s. It was reviewed in the 80s, again in the 90s, and is used today still to describe the six different ways we love. Before I reveal them and their meanings, it would be much more fun to find out your love style first. Clyde and Susan Hendrick designed a 42-item questionnaire to match Lee's love styles so that you can determine which one you are. It's called the Love Attitude Scale, or LAS. Googleable. There's also a second method, which is faster and shorter. 18 items. For the 18 statements, use a five-point Likert scale. Five being strongly agree, one being strongly disagree, and three neutral. The instructions suggest basing your responses on your most recent relationship. And if you haven't been in one, imagine how you think it would be. Go ahead. Pause me. Or follow along with my commentary. One, my partner and I have the right physical chemistry between us. Yes. Two, I feel my lover and I were meant for each other. Moderately agree. Three, my partner fits my ideal standards of physical beauty and handsomeness. Hmm, <laughs> freckles. Four, I believe that what my partner doesn't know about me won't hurt him or her. Sir. No way. My secrets make me sick and I don't suffer silently. Five, I have sometimes had to keep my partner from finding out about other lovers. Ah, <laughs> maturity. Six, my partner would get upset if he or she knew of some of the things I've done with other people. Seven, our love is the best kind because it grew out of a long friendship. <laughs> There's a pretty awesome love ignited by immediate sparks. Our friendship merged gradually into love over time. To a different kind of love. Yes. Nine, our love relationship is the most satisfying because it developed from a good friendship. Uh, half and half. Ten, a main consideration in choosing my partner was how he or she reflected on my family. Minimally, I suppose. Eleven, an important factor in choosing my partner was whether or not he or she would be a good parent. Only because a good parent usually means goodness. Twelve, one consideration in choosing my partner was how he or she would reflect my career. Respectful lover. Check. When my partner doesn't pay attention to me, I feel sick all over. Ah, the art of self-soothing. 14, I cannot relax if I suspect that my partner is with someone else. 15, if my partner ignores me for a while, I sometimes do stupid things to try and get his or her attention back. 16, I would rather suffer myself than to let my partner suffer. No. 17, I cannot be happy unless I place my partner's happiness needs before my own. Nope. And 18, I'm usually willing to sacrifice my own wishes to let my partner achieve his or hers. Strongly disagree. No sacrifice needs to be made. I can negotiate. Okay, now bracket the statements into chunks of three and add them up. The highest score for a love style would be 15, the lowest three. Wow, this reflects a very different Lindsay than my adolescence. All right, now for the breakdown of what each of these love styles say about you. Eros is passionate. It's like being struck by Cupid's arrow. Immediate attraction, like love at first sight. And because Eros lovers like touch, they tend to become more intimate before other love styles. The emphasis is on high intensity romance, so it's a little less sustainable and a lot shorter lived. Ludus is playful. It's a flirtatious love about the pursuit and the seduction. Relationship, blah. When the seeker wins over the sot, usually marked by sex, then the game, I mean relationship, 
is over. Sometimes with another chase already in place, so there's not a moment without action. Storge is friendly. In Greek, it means natural affection. Things start off as a close friendship and then develop into intimacy. Relating to one another precedes passion and sex. And if the romance dissipates, then the friendship withstands. Pragma is practical. Pragma, like pragmatic. It's like a business partnership. The person is looking for whatever is convenient and advantageous, what is going to serve them in a partner. Good person, good parent, good mate, good cook. It all precedes passion and romance. Mania is possessive. It's a destructive passion, like when a person says, I'm madly in love with you. Watch out. Lovers of this style may experience the greatest highs like they're swelling with love, which is why many people who are new to love find themselves in mania. The danger comes when the pendulum swings over here and you have extreme lows of unreasonable jealousy, obsession, and neediness. Agape is selfless. To some, agape is the ultimate form of love. To others, it's clearly martyrdom. The kind of love that a mother might have for a child, but not a healthy love for two partners because then it becomes all about giving when love should be a balance between giving and receiving. There are qualities of agape that are admirable, like its non-demanding nature. It's generous, kind, and patient. Let's just make sure it's not long-suffering. You may be curious to know how your love style is compatible with another's. I've made you a picture. In return, I ask for your pop culture examples of each of these six love styles. Please put them below. There are many other models and theories about love out there. Go find them. Stay curious. You can't take the love away from me. In order to truly feel loved, we need to be able to be vulnerable and intimate with our partners, and doing so requires self-disclosure. So self-disclosure is defined as revealing par personal, private, and intimate thoughts, feelings, and information to another person. <clears throat> How much should you reveal about yourself? We've all experienced the TMI phenomenon, too much information, but in relationships, communication leads to lasting relationships. So opening up is necessary to intimacy, and some researchers consider it the most important factor. So self-disclosure in relationships usually does increase over time. And some of the reasons that scientists have found self-disclosure increases intimacy are number one, we tend to like people that reveal personal information to us. Two, we are more likely to disclose personal information to someone we are romantically attracted to. And three, disclosing information makes us feel more attracted to someone. Most relationships progress after a long talk of revealing personal information, and many people can remember a talk that lasted all night that moved their relationship to the next level. And this is the point where people tend to report that they feel like they are falling in love after one of these long talks. In online relationships, people reveal more quickly um, than they do in face-to-face -face relationships. However, uh, there is more lying and self-disclosure online than there is in face-to-face -face relationships. And so uh, we've seen that phenomenon with the show Catfish, uh, where people will create fake online profiles on dating websites and apps. So let's watch a video now on a case of Catfish. Now we take a closer look at loneliness, romance, and secrets. The story of Manti Teo, the football star whose girlfriend never really existed, points to something new in our changing world. Not just a little deception, but a cruel and humiliating charade made possible by the digital age. And ABC's Dan Harris has more on the latest discrepancies between the dream of romance and reality. Dan. It's a fascinating story, Diane. Good evening to you. There are some reports that the girl who apparently so enraptured Manti Teo was not a girl at all, but instead a young man. There are still a lot of open questions about this case, of course, but what we do know is that romantic deception in the age of the Internet is rampant. You fell in love with a blonde named Abby, but it was really and this girl. Pretty much all of it was, you know, me, just not me. A muscle man named Scorpio turned out to be this guy. I'm not sure what I was thinking. And the chiseled jaw of Jameson King grabbed the heart of a girl named Sunny. We'll show you how that turned out in a moment. With so many of us living and loving on the internet, a seething sea of the unverifiable, there is infinite room for deception. 
It's called being a catfish. The word comes from a 2010 documentary about Neve Shulman, a well-to-do, private school-educated photographer from New York City who for months thought he'd found the love of his life online until he learned Megan was actually Angela. I want to see pain in your eyes. This thing, can you talk like this? Angela had a couple of cell phones so that Yaniv would get calls from different people. And sometimes that's all it takes to believe in the whole world. Rel Shulman is Neve's older brother. He directed the movie, which has now become an MTV show. The internet gives us all these new tools for right. perception, but at the root of it is the same thing. Yeah, and I, I think at the root of that, and it's been the same for centuries, um, is uh, just sort of loneliness and a need to connect. Rel and his brother have been watching the Manti Teo case with keen interest. Today, it's being reported that Teo's fake girlfriend, Lene, was texting and calling him before every game and was even in touch with his friends, family, and teammates. Many catfish are serial offenders, as was the case with Jameson King. Uh, we were looking for Jameson. Oh, no. So, is he here? It's me. What? Who, as Sonny learned, was actually this woman who, the show says, had a series of victims over four years. So when we do engage in self-disclosure with our partners, there are ways that we can have effective communication. And so researchers have found that the claim we never fight may not be a good sign or even indicate happiness. The style of communication um, during the fight is what is important, not how much a couple fights. So there are three styles of communication that lead to healthy relationships. The first is called validating, and this is when conflicts are resolved through calm discussion and compromise. Each side makes it a point to respect and acknowledge the other, other's position and their emotions. People that do validating as a form of communication tend to have fewer fights than others, and recent research shows that these couples last longer than volatile um, patterns of communication. So volatile uh, patterns of communication are when conflict arises frequently, the people fight, bicker, and explode more commonly than most, and they don't hold back but feel equal to their partner in their ability to defend their position, so they don't belittle or demean their partner. And they solve conflicts by fighting them out, but on the flip side, they usually have very passionate and happy relationships. And then the third style of communication is conflict avoiding, which is when people avoid fighting. And so what they do is they focus on their similarities and find disagreements to be of little importance. So they don't really need a resolution, a resolution because they tend to be able to let things go. Those were methods of effective communication, but now let's talk about communication patterns that can actually cause relationships to deteriorate. And by knowing what they are, you can intervene and stop the pattern. So there's actually four communication patterns that are generally the most detrimental to a relationship. And the first one is criticism, which is verbal fault finding, such as commenting on a character flaw in the partner. This is not to be confused with complaining, which is healthy. Complaining is expressing an unmet need, which is something a person desires but is not receiving from a partner. When complaining doesn't result in healthy communication, this is when we see resentment build and criticism starts. If you are using you statements rather than I statements, you have moved from complaining to criticizing. The next uh, communication pattern that's harmful is contempt. And so contempt is defined as disrespect, disgust, or hate expressed when the positive feelings partners once had for each other have dissipated. And contempt develops from criticism. It's characterized by disgust, disrespect, even hate. And criticism focuses on what a person does, but contempt focuses on who a person is. Comments are intended to hurt and cause pain using information that only an intimate partner would know. So some tactics that are used in this communication pattern include name calling, mockery, sarcasm, painful insults, and one thing that we can see in contempt is that uh, generally the person that has the contempt is curling their upper lip. 
The next pattern is defensiveness, and this allows each partner to deny responsibility, which makes resolution impossible, and it develops from contempt. Some of the defensiveness tactics that researchers have found are denying responsibility, making excuses or blaming external forces, disagreeing with all complaints, cross-complaining, which is when someone, uh, you tell your partner a complaint and they just issue back another complaint without addressing yours, and then repeating your position. And then the next pattern is stonewalling, and this is relying on a passive form of power and aggression by being unresponsive when disagreements and disputes erupt. It develops from criticism, contempt, and defensiveness, and what it says to your partner is, I don't care enough about this relationship or you to even try to work it out. And so once people get into the pattern of stonewalling, uh, usually the relationship ends in a breakup. So there is a plan called Prevention and Relationship Enhancement Program, and it um, has five keys. The intent of it is to help couples who lack or have lost effective communication patterns rebuild, and um, these five keys are based on research that show um, that couples that are having a hard time communication, uh, communicating can really turn it around using this program. So the first key is decide, don't slide. So don't ignore problems. Make an effort to communicate all the time about positive and negative things going on in your relationship. The second key is to do your part. Take responsibility for your faults. Don't blame everything on the other person. When people accept responsibility for an issue, it is less likely to arise again, and if it does, it's resolved quicker. And don't forget to nurture the relationship, make an effort, and choose your battles. Let the small things go. The third key is to make it safe to connect. So healthy relationships use strategies to solve conflicts so that they don't fester. If one partner feels the other will become hostile, criticize, or belittle the other's concerns, then they don't communicate with them. So we need to create a safe environment where our partner can open um, up and we can both be open to working on and resolving conflict. The fourth key is open the doors to positive connection. So maintain love, fun, intimacy, passion, friendship, and mutual support. Uh, do things that you both like together and try to focus on the good in your relationship. And the fifth key is to nurture your commitment. Actively focus on the previous four steps. Each person needs to communicate their commitment to the relationship. Affirmations are important, especially during conflict, because it creates a feeling of safety. So saying, I love you, we're going to get through this, I'm just really frustrated right now, or things like that that kind of affirm the other person and let them know that you're um, still sticking with your commitment to love them. All right, so for lecture activity three, I'd like for you to think of a relationship that you have had. It can be a romantic relationship, a friendship, a relationship with a coach, a family member, whoever. Um, and so think of a relationship where communication was an issue. Maybe it um, caused fights or it caused tension or potentially even a breakup or an end of the relationship. And I'd like for you to tell me, um, what went wrong? Why was communication an issue? Were you not communicating? Uh, were you engaging in any of the um, four ineffective patterns of communication? Um, what was the issue? And then how do you think that you could have resolved that issue um, now that you know about the keys to um, successful communication and some of the things we've talked about in this lecture today? So give me two to three sentences on uh, that at a minimum. So in intimate relationships, it's important to be able to talk about your emotions and your feelings, but studies show that talking about sex increases sexual satisfaction and overall satisfaction in a relationship. So in our sex-obsessed culture, we are still uncomfortable talking about sex with our partner. Many people believe that when you're in love, sex will just take care of itself. But if left not discussed, couples often experience sexual problems. So one of the resolutions for this is to engage in sexual self-disclosure, which is revealing private sexual thoughts and feelings to another person. Your likes, your dislikes, your needs, desires, any fears or concerns that you may have, any STIs that you have or have had in the past, past experiences, your sexual values and morals, and conditions for when you're comfortable having sex or the type of sex you're comfortable having. 
But most people don't engage in sexual dis uh, self-disclosure, and some of the reasons are lack of information. People just don't know how to talk about sex. Um, the next one is embarrassment. For some people, the uncomfortability with sex will cause them to break up rather than to talk about it. Insecurity about using the right words. So scientific words can be kind of stuffy for some people to talk about, but then street jargon can be kind of offensive or too aggressive. Um, another reason people don't engage in sexual self-disclosure is because of sexual taboos. So some people grow up in a culture or family that never talks about sex, and that sexual repression stays with them their whole lives. The next one is fear of judgment. So um, they might fear that their partner can be disgusted, shocked, or offended by um, their sexual self-disclosure. And finally, some people don't talk about sex with their partner because they fear rejection. It is possible uh, that your partner could really not like what you're saying and reject you because of it, but couples who can't talk about sex usually end poorly anyways. So not being able to talk about sex is one of many reasons why relationships could possibly fail. But let's talk about 10 of the most common reasons why relationships fail. So the first reason is a lack of self-knowledge. If you don't know your values, likes, needs, interests, field of eligibles, you may find yourself in the wrong relationship. So it's important to be self-aware. The next a reason is acceptance of sexual myths and stereotypes. Relationships can be ruined because these things create false expectations. So there's lots of st stereotypes about gender, like um, men should make the money, men should initiate sex, all women can have multiple orgasms, and if you believe those myths and stereotypes, then you have an unrealistic expectation of your partner. The next one is ineffective communication. Um, so if you don't communicate with your partner, then you're not really being open, and this uh, does not lead to intimacy, and without intimacy, it's very hard to maintain a relationship. The next one is imbalance of decision-making power. So um, both people don't have to decide on everything together all the time, but at least divide up duties so not one person has all of the power all of the time. And then low self-esteem, insecurity, and lack of self-confidence is another reason that relationships fail. So feeling unworthy of love causes the weaker partner to be overly dependent on the stronger prop, uh, partner. And this is just not an attractive thing. Um, no one can be your everything and provide everything for you, and it's unfair to put that on someone else. The next reason is isolation. So when people fall in love, sometimes they stop hanging out with their friends, but really no two people can meet all of each other's needs. So people need a support network made up of friends, family, coworkers, a bunch of uh, different people to socialize, not just your partner. Another reason people break up is failing to keep promises, lying, or cheating. So obviously, you know, you don't want to lie or cheat because that creates mistrust. Um, but even if you say you're going to work on something within yourself, like your temper, for example, and then you don't, things like that can also create mistrust, mistrust which is bad for a relationship. And then excessive jealousy is another reason relationships fail. It's actually cited as one of the most common reasons for breakups. So there's normal jealousy, which is jealousy based on an actual threat to the relationship. Um, for example, like when one partner discovers that the other has been sexually unfaithful. And then there's pathological jealousy, which is jealousy felt within one partner despite the fact that no actual threat to the relationship exists. And this type of jealousy stems from low self-esteem and an over-dependence on a partner. And often it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, meaning if you're constantly accusing someone of cheating over and over again, sometimes eventually they do actually end up cheating on you um, because you're accusing, of, accusing them of it anyway, and they now maybe find you not as attractive since you're acting kind of um, over-dependent and, and insecure. Um, another reason that people uh, break up is controlling behaviors. So both partners need to feel that being in the relationship is their choice and that they're free to be themselves. So usually controlling behaviors only get worse and the other person becomes less happy and that leaves the controlling person even more insecure and often even more controlling. And then the last reason that um, relationships fail is abuse and violence. Actually, one-third of women that are murdered are murdered by their partners. 
And it's much more common that women are the victim of abuse and violence than men. So intimate partner violence is defined as violence that occurs in the context of a relationship. Sometimes this is referred to as domestic violence. And many people think that the woman should just leave, but it's actually a lot more complicated than that. So check out this video on why women stay in abusive relationships. Trigger warning that I will be talking about intimate partner violence and domestic violence in this episode and various forms that it can take. Hashtag why I stayed, because after being stuck in an abusive relationship for a while, I started to believe I deserved all of it. week on Stuff Mom Never Told You. Well, on Monday I kicked things off with men can get pregnant too, or Kristen learns a lesson in avoiding cisnormativity when talking about reproductive rights. On Wednesday I answered a question a lot of you had about where the dumb blonde stereotype comes from. And on Friday I asked whether this whole basic bitch thing is sexist. Now on to Ask Kristen. First of all, thanks to everybody who watched and commented on last week's Ask Kristen video. Why don't guys compliment guys? On the one hand, Facundo Corradini says, we do all the time. At least here in Argentina, we compliment our male friends just as we do with our female friends. Wonderful Argentina. On the other hand, Yuri Vilas Boas said, after I thought about the matter some time, I realized that no, I didn't compliment men and that's exactly why. I didn't want to seem gay. And since I also realized there's absolutely nothing wrong with being gay, I started making efforts to compliment men. Now to this week's Ask Kristen question from Christiane Williams. Why do people stay in abusive relationships? As probably any of us who have fallen in love, gotten a hardcore crush, been in a long-term relationship can attest, shutting off all of those feelings and walking away and never looking back is not so simple. I personally have stayed in not outright abusive relationships, but relationships that were not good or healthy for me, with people who were not good or healthy for me for way longer than I should have. There's a commonly cited statistic that it takes someone seven times leaving an abusive relationship before they finally go for good. A lot of it is fueled by something referred to as the cycle of abuse. So it starts out with an incident of abuse, which is a power play to show the other person in the relationship that you are the boss, you are in control, not only of the relationship, but also of that person. There might be a period of guilt in which the abuser is guilty for his or her actions, not so much because they're uncomfortable with what they've done, but rather guilty at the prospect of being caught. In order to assuage that guilt, the abuser tends to start looking for excuses. Pinpointing all of the wrong things that the other person did to bring on that abuse. Then a period of normalcy tends to set in where the abuser might go out of his or her way to be extra kind and sweet. This is often referred to as a honeymoon phase where the person who has been the target of abuse might think, oh, this is stopping. He or she has changed. Soon enough, the abuser then enters into a phase of fantasy and planning of imagining abusing yet again and looking for excuses and reasons. Then comes the setup. The thing that the abuser is waiting for to happen to trigger the abuse. And then the cycle begins anew. There's also an isolation factor. The person in the relationship might not leave because he or she doesn't feel like they have anywhere else to go. Another big factor that keeps people in abusive relationships, especially if there are children involved, is the risk of poverty and homelessness. One facet of domestic or intimate partner violence is economic abuse, wherein the abuser restricts the victim's access to money, possibly to getting a job, certainly to getting credit cards. Even if that person has a job, the abuser will often interfere with their day-to-day -day work life, especially if they attempt leaving. If they choose to leave, when that happens, they often have to immediately take time off of work to relocate, to go to court, to coordinate with law enforcement officers. For more specifics on why people stay in abusive relationships, I highly recommend you look up the Twitter hashtag, why I stayed. This hashtag was started to highlight how leaving an abusive relationship is often the exception 
rather than the rule. Hashtag why I stayed. Because he never hit me and I didn't think verbal abuse and emotional manipulation was considered an abusive relationship. Hashtag why I stayed. Because I was 15 and he said he loved me and I didn't know what love was. Hashtag why I stayed. He said he would change. He promised it was the last time. I believed him. He lied. Why is this happening? Even though more than one in three and one in five men, at least just in the United States, will experience some form of intimate partner violence. We only talk about it after the fact. It's usually such a reactive conversation. It's not proactive in the sense of us actually taking the time to fully understand relationship violence and domestic violence and, and the many different forms that it can take. And also doing our due diligence to talk to teens about dating violence as well. This starts when we are young. Women between the ages of 20 and 24 are at highest risk of domestic violence. It's time that we start more proactive conversations on domestic violence to stem this epidemic. The solution requires all of us. So there's different types of relationship abuse and relationship abuse is actually more common than people think. Um, it usually is male on female violence. A 2008 study showed that 650,000 people are victims and 550,000 of those are women. The goal of abusers is usually to crush the victim's self-image, gain power and control, and cause fear. Abuse is complicated and can take many different forms, but two signs are great indicators of abuse. And those two signs are power and control. So power and control are achieved through a wide range of tactics which develop over time. Um, so you can see about the power and control wheel on um, the slide here. There's usually a pattern. One event does not always indicate abuse. It is when the behavior happens repeatedly and seems to escalate over time. So the different types of relationship abuse that we're going to talk about here are physical abuse, which is physical restraint, pushing, grabbing, hitting, biting, pinching, cutting, rape, hitting with objects, physical intimidation, and so on. And studies show that the actual number of male perpetrators may actually be three to four times the documented percentage because many women don't report their abuse. And the next type of abuse is verbal abuse, and this includes yelling, threats, intimidation, ridiculing, name-calling, criticizing, accusing, insulting, humiliating, swearing, blaming, belittling, mocking, sarcasm, puts down, and trivial, uh, trivializing the victim's ideas, opinions, and wishes. And the last one is emotional abuse, which is an attempt to make the partner feel unworthy of love, unattractive, sexually unskilled, and at fault for the abuse. And so some of the behaviors that we might see in emotional abuse is the abuser has a sense of entitlement, will withhold information, will withhold sex, they will misrepresent the person's feelings, they often engage in risk-taking behaviors like drugs and alcohol, they will withhold help to the person, excessive jealousy, threats of suicide, and threatening the other person. So this type of abuse is much harder to identify than physical abuse um, because it kind of happens in a more subtle way. So the video on why women don't leave abusive relationships talked about the cycle of violence, but just to recap, it's the repetitive pattern of stages that define most abusive and violent relationships. And it involves cycling through the honeymoon stage, the tension building phase, and the explosion of violence, which is then followed by a return to the honeymoon stage and the beginning of a new cycle. So the cycle usually happens over time, which makes it difficult to identify when it actually started. And abuse is usually not constant, so weeks can go by without any abuse occurring. Most relationships start in the honeymoon phase, but this ends with time even in healthy relationships, like we talked about earlier. And conflict inevitably arises, and in healthy relationships, communication then occurs and resolution happens. But in unhealthy relationships, rational problem solving doesn't work, and one person gives in to the other to maintain harmony. So tension will continue in what's called the tension building phase, and this results in an abusive or violent explosion. Again, the abused person does whatever they can to calm the situation and calm their abuser. And then the honeymoon phase occurs after the violence, and this is where the abuser apologizes, buys gifts, 
or maybe even denies the abuse altogether. Victims hope that this stage will last and usually convince themselves it is over and that the relationship will get better and the abuse will cease to occur anymore. So if you know someone or you are being abused, contact 1-800-799-SAFE or visit the website www.ndvh.org for help. All right, that is it for Chapter 4, so make sure that you submit all of the lecture activities and complete all of the assignments associated with this chapter, and we will see you for the next one. Have a good day.